you know, if you told me two years ago that in 2023 I'd be sitting here making this video, I absolutely would not have believed you. But here we are. I finished this. Why did I finish this? Gravity's Rainbow is often considered to be one of the three hardest works of literature that people on the internet love to talk about. It goes Infinite Jest, Gravity's Rainbow, Ulysses. This is what a lot of people call the trifecta of difficult novels. This novel was so difficult, it was very, very challenging. But also, it makes me wonder why. Um, I don't know if I fully understood it. I know that I should probably look more deeply into it, do more research into it, but I just wanted to talk about my initial impressions having read it, and probably make some discussions as to how a I don't know if I'd call myself a normal person, but how a normal person might approach a text like this, because it's doable, I did it. I never thought I would be the kind of person to say this, but I did complete it. Now what? <laughs> so a bit of background, this book was published in 1970. It's by an author named Thomas Pynchon who's known for his complexity in his literature. He is a person who very odd person. He's reclusive, he's very rarely in the public eye, and he's written quite a few novels like this. So this is actually the second Pinchon novel that I've read in my life. The first one was The Crying of Lot something, Crying of Lot 49, I don't know what the number is, uh, uh, I really should have got this out. Um, but that, I read that for university, that was an introduction to postmodernism. It's a lot shorter, it's a little bit more accessible, still very weird. This book though is huge, this book is something like 300,000 words. My edition is 760 pages. It's frustratingly only got four real chapters. It's divided up into little sections, but it's still really hard to get through. A lot of people say it's got lots of characters, got something like 300 named characters, full of references to other works of literature, full of other weird things as well, songs, dances, images, mathematical equations. Uh, I make it sound like it's really smart and really intelligent, but it is also one of the most overwhelmingly stupid things I've ever read. I think every time I try to describe this book to someone else, I have to stop myself because I think this is so dumb. This is so incredibly dumb that I can't believe that it's published. I can't believe that it exists in the world. There are people reading it, people enjoying it, people talking about what it means when it's just, it's so dumb. It's just, it's just, I can't, I can't understand how dumb it is. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why it has the reputation that it does, is that they are, there are communities out there on the internet trying to figure out all the little intricacies of this novel. There are much better YouTube videos than this explaining what the plot is about, explaining what the themes are, going for hours and hours, examining all the little details. I'm not gonna be doing that. Actually, when I was gonna make this video, I was going to make a video about how and why you shouldn't read this. Uh, but in the I guess in the effort of fairness, I took a look at what everyone else on the internet was saying, and there's actually a really nice and cute community of people loving Thomas Pynchon's work. They are discussing it online, sharing theories, doing read-alongs, like they read the book together and they talk about it like a little book club. It's just, it's so wholesome that it makes me feel bad to call them all idiots. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. I wasn't going to do that initially, but I'm definitely not going to do that now. Instead, I will still be saying at the end of the video to not read this but with a little asterisk, which is that if you're the kind of person who hears all the things I'm saying about this novel and thinks, actually, I'm gonna do it anyway, then you may actually hugely enjoy this because it's a lot. There's a lot in here. It's not a book that goes down easily. It's one of the sharpest, harshest, strangest, most challenging things that exists. And if you was the very specific type of person, I was gonna say odd, and I think a lot of Pinchon fans would not be offended if I called them odd. Uh, but if you're a very specific kind of person that would like this, then it exists, it's out there. Enjoy it. I've already spent five minutes talking about this book and I haven't even mentioned what it's about. So it's set in World War II. It is about the Nazi V2 rockets that were being fired from Germany into the UK. They were trying to figure out the trajectory of these rockets, trying to figure out how to protect people, how to predict the ways that these rockets are being fired, but as this division is doing all this research, trying to figure out all the different mathematical, psychological, spiritual ways of determining 
the German rockets, they realize that there's this deep secret conspiracy plot of creating the, the ultimate missile, the missile with the code name 0000, the one which has a sort of spiritual significance to the people who are building it, the people who are making it, almost in the sense that there is a predetermined disposition of humanity to build this rocket. And so we follow characters who go on this very strange quest, meet characters all across Europe through different walks of life, different parts of history, in order to try and pass out the nature of this rocket. Where is this rocket? Can it be prevented from being fired? Or even what is it? Why are people building it? And what do all the strange things and words mean? Because nothing in this novel is simple, nothing is straightforward. Characters have multiple motivations, they also have weird and strange powers. It's almost kind of like a magic realism novel. There are characters who are psychic, or who can have very vivid dreams, or who make things out of reality. It's just... nothing is really spelt out for you, though. And so, it makes me loathe to describe this as a war novel, or as a quest novel, even though it is both those things. It's also a comedy, and it's also a tragedy, but it's also both and neither of those things. It's just too difficult to categorize. I feel like any way of describing it like this oversimplifies it, because if anyone wanted a World War II novel, don't read this. And if anyone wanted just a straight comedy, or just a straight, I don't know, any kind of drama text, there are other things that do it better. This book is just... the chaos is part of it. I think the, the genre, and I've heard people describe it as well, the genre is paranoia, or paranoid. It's encyclopedic, it's everything and the kitchen sink itself thrown in there, with a lot of really taboo and transgressive things in there just for shock value sometimes. You don't know what you're going to get. Every time you get to a new section, you're just disorientated completely. There are sections of the book where I still... I don't know if it's real, like, I don't know how it got in there, I don't know how he thought of things like this, and yet it's all just there, together. Figure it out. I'm just going to try and describe the pros and cons of this book to try and help you understand whether or not you should read it. Uh, maybe I'll do some editing here and there, I don't know, my left and right. Uh, but, okay, my left is this way. <laughs> what am I doing? So, I'm going to start with the pros first because I want the cons to take more significance, right? I'm going to end this video by saying don't read this. I'm going to, I'm going to keep reminding myself of this because otherwise I'm going to go on huge tangents. Don't read this book. Uh, pros. What do I think is good about this novel? Uh, it meets the hype of the complexity. I definitely think that out of all the books that people have told me, hey, it's really hard, you're going to have a hard time reading it, this is the one that fits that bill. I made it through Moby Dick, I could do that. I made it through The Grapes of Wrath, I could do that. I made it through Wuthering Heights, I made it through um, Crime and Punishment. All very difficult books, all also very doable. I think each of those texts I could finish and say, I got this out of it, I have this meaning out of it. Whereas this one, I still finish and think, I don't feel like I'm done. I think there's still a lot more to go. And if you're someone who likes that act of searching, likes that potential complexity, then this one gives you that feeling of not doneness, right? It is complex enough that you can keep thinking about it and keep theorizing about it, whereas I do feel like with all the other more challenging texts I've gone out and read, I've figured most of it out. I've figured enough of it out that I can make a theory about it. So that's, I guess, a good thing. Another good thing is that it really doesn't take itself seriously, which means that you can laugh very frequently. There are lots of scenes in this novel where I would just describe them to friends for fun because, I, again, I just can't believe that they're in here. Uh, one of the earliest things is this character called Slotherup, who is the closest that we get to a protagonist. He has some sort of sexual connection to the missiles, to the point where every time he has a one-night stand, a couple of days later, a V2 rocket hits the building and blows it up. And it's theorized that the reason why this happens, and no one really knows exactly why it happens, but it's theorized one of the reasons because as a kid, he was subjected to psychological conditioning training, where to evoke a Pavlovian response, a scientist taught his young infant brain to have an erection every time there was a loud noise nearby. And when he was deconditioning it, it went the whole other direction. So now there's an inverse relationship. Whenever he gets an erection, a loud noise needs to happen somewhere. 
or something like that. I don't know, it's not very well explained, but just the thought of that is just so funny, right? A person who has sexual escapades across London attracts missiles, and we have this whole military apartment who is breaking their backs and racking their brains trying to figure out how do we possibly figure out where these missiles are hitting London, and one person goes, hey, wait a minute, this guy's plotting a map that's exactly the same as the missiles that we're trying to track. And it's just some guy's one-night stand. It's, it's so funny. It's so stupid. And there's, there's lots of scenes like this where characters just do absolutely bizarre things that I just don't... I, I can't believe someone thought of this and put it into a book and is still considered one of the most difficult and intelligent books ever written. It's just... it's so stupid. It's so stupid. I've never read a more stupid book. That is a pro. That's honestly a pro. It's... This is a book of most. This is a book of most weird, most extensive, most difficult, most stupid. It's got all of those things. And this is not true for me, but it may be true for other people. There is a lot of psychological complexity in the book. There is a lot of discussion on civilization and government and how large, organized, well, large, organized groups of people can eventually create their own destruction, uh, really building upon the context of post-World War II and the atom bomb, that kind of postmodern craziness that occurred where science and technology was supposed to bring about peace, supposed to bring about stability to end wars and end conflicts, and instead people seem driven by some sort of mystical force to destroy themselves. I think this is a book which really doesn't shy away from that very nihilistic thought about the human race and instead tries to grapple with it. Grapple with it so hard that it turns into a joke. That's what it's trying to do, I think, and this is the best attempt of me trying to explain that. And you can read it for that theme, but then you'll hit some scene where a character drops his harmonica in the toilet and swims through the sewage pipe to try and get it, and then you just go, whoa, <laughs> Let's talk about the cons. So the cons is that it is a deeply frustrating book. It is, it, it's trolling you, really. It's, it's the author making a joke at your expense to think that there is ever any meaning or significance behind this. You are honestly fighting a tide of just horrific, disgusting things to try and get any meaning out of this. And so it, it doesn't feel good to read. It feels really bad to read. It, it, you don't feel like you're making any progress and I had to stop and take pauses for months. I would just get bored or I would get frustrated and I would think I'm not going anywhere. And every time I pick it back up, I think I don't really know what's happening anymore. So I have to go back and figure it out. It's a difficult reading experience and it's a frustrating one. It's seemingly not written for human consumption. That's how I would describe it, is that nothing about it is there to help you understand it. You instead do probably need external assistance. So if you have a friend you're reading it alongside with, or you have a community like the Pinchon subreddit, or if you have a, a don't do this, but if you have a companion reader, there are lots of companion readers for Gravity's Rainbow. To me, I think that actually kind of kills the fun. I tried looking at what was contained in some of these companion readers. It's better to go into this book not knowing what you're going to get, because I think the frustration is really part of the appeal, or part of the experience, whereas if you have a companion reader, they will tell you what you should be interpreting or feeling in a certain situation, so it's not quite the same as if you were to read it by yourself. Uh, more cons. You need to have read a lot of other stuff to understand this. I don't really identify as a prolific reader. I have read an amount. I can say that if I hadn't read Slaughterhouse-Five and Catch-22, I would not have understood this at all, because I needed to have previously read works that took war and tried to make it funny to even just barely get what's happening here. Which means that I'm sure there's lots of other dynamics to this novel that I just don't understand, because I haven't read other things. Like, I haven't read The Elite Lad in the Odyssey, so I don't understand the quest narratives that are happening later. I've never watched Metropolis or any German expression films, so I don't know about the intellectual illusions there. Um, there are so many things that I haven't read and I haven't experienced, and I think I'm just locked out of those parts of the novel until I engage with that. So, if you're not a prolific reader, this will not help you try to understand it. And lastly, if you are in any way squeamish, if you don't like toilet humour, if you don't like very, very deviant depictions of sex, if you don't like 
violence, if you don't like just any taboo thing, if you're easily squeamish or easily put off, easily offended, there are some really disgusting passages in here. There are probably some of the most repulsive things I've read that don't even really feel like they need to be here because they're not connected to the plot at all, they're just kind of in here. I don't think I can look at a limerick at the same way ever again. Um, yeah, if you don't have a strong stomach for things that are, I'm just gonna say it, extremely gross, uh, you're not gonna enjoy this either. So you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, this is a book that doesn't want me to read it, and I would agree, don't read it. Uh, but if you are going to read it, here are my tips. So first of all is that if you are someone who wants to read this for the the bragging rights, to say that you are a really smart person and that you've read and you understood Gravity's Rainbow, you are going to hate this book the most. I think that kind of person is the target of the satire of this book. This book takes someone who thinks that they understand the human race and thinks that they understand difficult literature and spends the whole 760 pages laughing straight in their face because there is no way that there is some kind of big overarching theme here because every attempt that you make to try and get it is going to lead you into absurdity. So if you want to learn the truth of this, if you want to say, I got it, don't read it. Instead, what I would recommend is go into it with as little as you can. Go into it with no real expectations of what you'll get. Just try to follow the novel where it leads you. If it goes down a tangent, follow the tangent. If it ignores a character, you also ignore the character too. Forget things. Have a strange experience. Be open to finishing the book and thinking, wow, I only understood like 15% of that. Because the 15% that you do understand can be quite meaningful, can be quite memorable, and if, at the very least, you still have a fun thing to tell your friends, right? You still have a fun thing to say that you read this book and in it there's a character who swims through the sewer pipes, fine, right? You got something. Hello, it is late at night, it is no longer afternoon, and I have the very unenviable task of trying to summarize the narrative of Gravity's Rainbow. Now, this is going to be confusing, and for the folks that have read the book, I'm going to be leaving a lot of things out. It's just kind of impossible to explain what actually happens in this book. And for the folks that haven't read the book, please note that the plot summary is hopefully here to be helpful, but also it's going to cover about 30 or so percent of the book, and it's really not going to capture how it actually feels to read this thing. Uh, the actual connections between cause and effect are just so much more tenuous than what I'm about to explain here. So. This is the basic gist of who's who and what's happening, but you might still pick up the book and go, I still have no idea who's who and what's happening. Anyways, uh, this is not just my work, this is something that's built up over, over my own singular reading of the book, and also lots of really helpful resources. Uh, the Wikipedia summary was really helpful, the Gravity's Rainbow subreddit was really helpful, um, the library guy has a blog which has the chapters broken up, and that was really helpful. I think reading Gravity's Rainbow with a guide, to me, is the wrong way to do it, because being confused is absolutely part of the experience. Uh, it is very easy and very tempting, kind of like reading Shakespeare, to just read the guide and feel like you've got everything and just let the, pa let the pages just glaze over you, but part of the experience is trying to figure out exactly what happens in the pages. But if you have no intention of reading this book, then this is the very quick summary of basically what happens. So the novel is broken up into four large segments. Uh, each segment has smaller sections, and some people number these as chapters, but in most editions they're not numbered at all. So it's quite hard to figure out where one section is beginning, another section is ending, and the larger sections of four are divided up into these four titles, which you can't really see here because my face is really small. Number one is called Beyond the Zero, and the zero here refers to potentially refers to death, because the opening epigraph for Beyond the Zero is a quote from Werner von Braun, who was a, I believe, a real rocket scientist in Nazi Germany, and he says, Nature does not know extinction, all it knows is transformation. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. So it's a beginning, but it's also an immediate kind of ending, where the novel begins at towards the end of World War II, and if anything, it signals the beginning of this moment where human beings realize that they could be their own destruction. 
The character that we meet first off is called Pirate Prentice. He is a, a military private, and he's part of this military division called Achtung. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's kind of like a cleanup brigade towards the end of World War II. And his shtick, Pirate Prentice, is that he's kind of psychic. He can see the dreams and hallucinations of other people, and he can delve into the subconsciousness. He also has the thing for bananas. So he has this big banana farm on top of his military base, and he will just insist on cooking all of his other friends' bananas. His friend is named Teddy Bloat, and together between Prentice and Bloat, they seem to have this shadowy connection with this group called Pisces that operates out of a mental institution called the White Visitation. So that's really one of the core locations of the beginning of this novel, is the this secret organization of the White Visitation, what exactly do they do and how do they interact with the war and the people of Europe and England. Uh, we also meet Roger Mexico and Jessica Swanlake. These are two characters that will turn up later, sort of, but you don't really need to worry about them. The main thing you need to know is that Roger Mexico is a spy and Jessica Swanlake is someone that he is interested in, but she is engaged to Jeremy Beaver. He has the name Beaver because he has a chin that looks like very hairy, I think. But Roger Mexico and Jessica Swanlake have a have an affair during the war because they kind of need that physical connection. But it's always understood that when the war is over, Jessica's gonna go marry Jeremy Beaver, and Roger Mexico is a little bit bummed about that. But Mexico at the same time is a statistician. His job is to try and map out the various V2 rocket strikes that are coming from Germany and landing in landing all across London, because if they manage to find some kind of distribution or some kind of pattern for these rocket strikes, then they can start saving people, protecting people, but they can also start making some sense out of this whole war, right? Because the rockets, to an extent, seem to be random, but they also seem to have some kind of pattern. And so what they're doing here at Pisces is they're trying to figure out how various spiritual, magical things like seances, communicating with the dead, various spiritual things, could have military applications. To me, it reminds me a little bit of that kind of MK Ultra pseudoscience of the American military, although this is set in Britain. And so at the White Station, the leader is Pointsman, who is this Pavlovian scientist. His whole motivation is scientific advancement. He doesn't really care about who's fighting the war, who's winning the war. He just needs to make sure that the White Station keeps getting funding so they can keep researching, they can keep discovering more and more weird things about the human psyche. And so this research brings the attention to the closest thing to a protagonist this novel's going to have, called a man called um, Tyrone Slothrop. He is another soldier, also connected with Akhtung, but he has been making this map of London with little stars, and this map seems to correlate exactly with the map of missile strikes. So the weird thing, though, is that his stars seem to appear before the rocket strike, and the people at uh, the people at the military bureau trying to figure out this guy, this Slotrop, how is he figuring this up? And as it turns out, this map is actually the map of his one night stands across London. And so they realize that Slotrop has this strange Pavlovian connection between explosions or loud noises and his erections. We also meet Katya, who is this Dutch woman who's connected with Blissero. Oh, we're getting too many characters now. There's lots and lots of characters in the novel. Uh, the opening, Beyond the Zero, tries to explain some of them, but I don't think the intention is for you to actually know all these characters. I think it's the point is that you meet them as the story develops, but when you read it again, you go through Beyond the Zero and you go, oh yeah, it's those guys. So Katya is a young woman who, who in the backstory of the novel, was imprisoned by this German SS Nazi soldier named Blissero. Blissero, who's also called Weissman, German for white man, uh, he was a really, really evil dude. He participated in the genocide of the Herrera people in what is now today Namibia. I actually learned this from reading the novel, is that Germany occupied what is now Namibia in the very, very early 1900s, and they perpetrated some horrific racial acts of violence there. And so Blissero, what he had done in the 1900s is that he'd imprisoned Katia but also he'd taken a... we well, had a son named Enzian, and Enzian is a half Herrera German individual who's now in Europe and is trying to... well, his motivations aren't really explained, it's that he exists in Beyond Zero. 
uh, but he's often described as a kind of Frankenstein character. He's a character built up of the various motivations and factions of the war. We'll meet him later. We also meet, oh my goodness, Lenny and Franz Pockler. Franz Pockler is a rocket scientist that got his job completely by accident, a German rocket scientist. And so he doesn't really understand the motivations of what he's doing. He's just kind of going along with the flow. And Lenny is his wife who they're connected a bit weirdly. And so we have all of these individuals that are variously connected to the V2 rockets, to the development of missile technology in Germany, in Europe. Uh, we have strange psychic researchers trying to figure out the patterns of these rockets. And that's the setting of our scene is we've introduced to in my summary, like 20 characters, in the actual book, something like 50 characters, lots and lots of people, lots of different motivations. No one's really clear of what exactly is happening. And all amidst this, we have these weird dream sequences where cities are being taken over by giant amoebas, or people are falling into the toilets and swimming through debris. Like, it's a mess. Uh, the first section is often one of the hardest things that people get about Gravity's Rainbow because not really anything happens in Beyond Zero. It's mostly just introducing these characters and their interactions. And because we jump back and forth between all these characters, it's kind of hard to latch on to any single one of them. And if you make it through, you then make it to, oh, what is this next chapter called? Unperm al Casino Hermann Goering. I have no idea what this means. I could not figure it out. It doesn't really have any significance in the narrative either. But this section is where things start to happen because we start in France and it's after the war. Slothrop and his other soldiers, Teddy Bloat and another soldier named Tantivy, they're chilling in France. They're being just generic straight white dudes. They're trying to figure out who can have the most sex, basically. And so there's this strange occurrence where Teddy Bloat, who's working for the White Visitation, he arranges for Katya, who's also working for the White Visitation, to be captured by an octopus. And Slothrop is perfectly positioned to save her from this octopus, which means that they now meet. Now, why the octopus thing had to happen, I still can't really figure it out. I'm, just like everything in the novel, I wonder if it's some kind of weird sex thing. But regardless, Slothrop starts this romantic relationship with Katya, who is making him really paranoid because she seems connected to the White Visitation. So does Teddy Bloat. Slothrop doesn't really know who he's able to trust or who he's uh, connected with, really. And so he gets more and more paranoid. He finds out about this strange polymer or plastic called Implex G, which is made by the very real German company called IG Farben as part of the war. And Slothrop realizes that this polymer is potentially used in this secret rocket called the s Gerat or the schwartz Gerat, which has this serial code of 0000. And that's really the quest object of this novel, is to try and figure out what is the s Gerat, what is this rocket, what is it capable of doing, how is the how is Impulex G associated with it, who's making it, what's going to happen if it's made, all of these crazy things. But Slothrop realizes that he's being watched, or he's probably being watched by the White Visitation, so he changes the name to Ian Scuffling. He's going to change his name a lot over the course of the novel, just bear with it. And he becomes a war correspondent, and he ducks off to Zurich, and the White Visitation cannot find him anymore. That's basically what happens in section 2. And in section 3, called In the Zone, this is the longest section of the book. It goes for more than half of the runtime. And thankfully, it is a little bit more straightforward. It isn't straightforward, but the overarching narrative is a bit easier to understand because this whole section is about, well, the zone is Europe. It's the rebuilding or the damaged areas of Europe after World War II. And Slothrop is going to wander around this whole zone, trying to find more and more information about this uh, Swatsgerat and this missile. And you can read this as something of a quest narrative. It's not really straightforward. It's not a matter of cause and effect, one thing leads to another. But there are action sequences, there are more straightforward bits. There are all sorts of little fun things like songs and poems and lots and lots of drugs and orgies and it's just, it's a lot, it's a mess. But at least we have a main character now, at least we're following something. So. We start to learn about the people who are more and more implicated in the making of this rocket. We realize that Franz Pockler, who we met in part one, he is the rocket scientist who was working on the Esterat. Uh, he was also implicated in the creation of Imipolux G, which is this kind of weird sexual material. Like, it's a plastic, 
but whenever you touch it, it gives you this very sensual feeling. And I wonder if this is a parody, parody of something like nylon or latex that some people have fetishes for, I have no clue. But it also isn't very clear exactly how it factors into the rocket. Anyways, Slothrop meets this general named Major Marvy, who's American and very, very racist. But he has this crack theory that the Herero Africans that survived the genocide from the early 1900s, they are now in Europe and they are now trying to wage some kind of revenge war against Europe to create their own rocket. This turns out to be basically true, despite the fact that Major Marvy is super duper racist. Uh, so we find out that Endian, who is Blissfero's son, Enzian is raising up a Herrera army, and they are trying to build some kind of rocket, but it is a little bit shady still, they're not really clear on who's doing what. But they have their spies all through Europe trying to get as much information about the original rocket as they can. Meanwhile, there's another spy called Chicharin, who is from Russia, and he is opposed to Enzian, but what his motivations are exactly is also not clear, but Slothrop gets embroiled in all of this by meeting Major Marvi, meeting Enzian, and meeting Chicharin, and getting involved in a lot of romantic relationships that are quite oblique to these characters, finding information that becomes useful to them. There's really silly chase sequences. Slothrop keeps putting on these weird costumes. He puts on this like metal cap and gets called the Rocket Man. He puts on this pig mask. He goes onto <laughs> this ship, and there's all these really disturbing sex scenes which I just can't fathom exactly what they're there for except to be very shocking and to just model up the narrative and to combine our understanding of sex with our understanding of war with our understanding of death. Like Those three themes are just like in a blender for this entire in the zone section where Slothrop is just having sex through in his way through Europe, finding out more information with the rocket, but it's never straightforward, it's always weird. And we find out that in the creation of the original B2 rocket, it was just as weird, like Franz Pockler and Ilse, um, they have a really weird relationship, and that's also connected with this actress who was connected to the German Expressionism movement. That's also, I think her name is Marguerite or something, also very weird. And so nothing is that straightforward, and then we end in the zone with this strange literary montage of just sex and rocket parts and uncertainty. Like, that's what Europe is at the end of World War II, is that it's just an absolute mess. Now, towards the end of In the Zone, we realize that the other characters from before are gathering together to form some kind of counterforce. Now, what they're the counterforce to is not super clear, but it is comprised of Pirate Prentice, uh, Katya, the kinds of remnants of the old White Visitation folks, and a lot of the soldiers from before, like Roger Mexico and Jessica, they sort of get implicated in this counterforce, which they're trying to, in very simple terms, maybe save the world or oppose the development of the rocket. It's not really clear exactly, but we start to meet these characters again. So all the characters that we haven't heard from for basically the entire book, like Roger Mexico and Jessica and Power Apprentice, they're all back and we have to remember them. So now that the war is over, Jessica is going to go marry Jeremy Beaver, Roger Mexico is focusing on his work in the counterforce, but he's also messing about with the relationship. There's this really bizarre episode where Roger Mexico and another soldier named um, Bodine, they go to Jessica's party that she and Jeremy Beaver invite them to as kind of like a peace officer, peace offering. And they disgust everyone to the point of shooing everyone away. It's one of the most disgusting scenes I've ever read in fiction. Uh, but what does that even mean? I don't know. And towards the end, we realize that all the factions are slowly starting to succeed. Like, Enzian and the Herrero do start to successfully build their own rocket. They codename it the 00001. Uh, meanwhile, Enzian and Chicharin, they don't really have this big conflict. They still do keep finding information. But it gets towards the end where we realize that Blissero and his rocket has been successfully built. And towards the end of the novel, we have these little vignettes of different things that happened across this time, different characters going through different interac interactions, but all the while, the missile is being built, and then towards the end, it gets launched, it has a success ascent, it is a bizarrely sexual thing. I can't come quite close to explaining just what it is or how it feels, but the missile has its ascent, and it has its descent. And we end with this scene in a movie theater 
where the character is just kind of waiting for the movie to start, and the novel ends mid-sentence. Now everybody. So that's Gravity's Rainbow, as best as I can describe it. I'm still glossing over so much of this novel, it is genuinely so strange, so bizarre, so full and so messy that I can't describe it very easily. But at the end of the day, what does all of this mean? What's the point? And here is where I'm starting to say why you shouldn't read this book, is because in the great postmodern tradition, it's entirely possible that this book means nothing. It's a book about how the search for meaning in itself is a meaningless exercise, and the time and effort that you spent in trying to figure out what is meant by this book is completely wasted, so it sucks to be you. Uh, and I think that any Pinchon fan, even if you've read this many, many times, I don't think you can really discount that reading. I don't think you can really set aside the potential for this book to be entirely meaningless. But that being said, it still exists. It's still big. It's still 760 pages, and there are still people out there saying that it is incredible and meaningful. And if you really want to dig into it, you probably can find some interesting themes about war, about society, about the way that we treat information in a current day and age. And at the very least, it's still, at times, depending on your sense of humor, kind of fun. It's got lots of songs, lots of poems, lots of weird, funny moments, lots of moments where if you describe them to somebody else, they'll think you're messing with them until they read it themselves and they realize, actually, no, that's not even the beginning of how weird this book gets. So that's it. If you don't want to read this, that's totally fine. I feel like most of the population will never need to read or understand this book. Only if you are the specific kind of strange, odd fellow that might find this enjoyable, there is a whole community of people out there that will gladly introduce you to Thomas Pinchon. Now, what's that noise?